This month on the World Sailing Show. The first video of an AC-75 capsize. The superstars of the sailing world crown their champion. And the young stars flying high in Brazil. But first, the climax of the Brest Atlantique. Last month in the World Sailing Show, some of the biggest names in sailing set sail in a brand new challenge for Ultime Trimorans. It was a baptism of fire as the race began off the west coast of France. The boats took a pounding as they headed southwest down the Atlantic. Rockstar sailor Francois Gabar and his partner, Gwenole Gahine, took the slightest of leads in the rough waters, but at what cost? Damage to their boat Massif meant they had to stop in Brazil for repairs. Frank Camas aboard Edmund de Rothschild also needed to stop. With the leading boats being worked on ashore, Thomas Coville took Sodebo into the lead. 15 days hard sailing and a battering from South Atlantic storms saw the fleet reach the second and final race mark off Cape Town. In front were Camas and Charles Cordrelier on Rothschild. Oh. But for Coville, this was the end. Damage to Sedebo's rudder could not be repaired and the pair were forced to retire. And so four have become three. Bon vent à ceux qui, qui sont encore en course là. Faites attention à vous et à très bientôt. The race had set off from Brest 15 days earlier on a 14,000 mile loop. Ahead of the three surviving boats now remained 7,000 nautical miles. There would be no more opportunities to moor and repair. The next stop was the finish line. America's Cup skipper Frank Camas and Volvo Ocean Race winner Charles Cordrelier left Cape Town with a slender lead aboard Rothschild. But Massif and Actual hounded them all the way up the Namibian coast. After the dramatic conditions earlier in the race, the sailors now faced several days of very light breeze as they headed west in search of the trade winds. Soon, a split developed. Rothschild and Actual turned north and headed for the doldrums. Massif chose to travel further west, where they'd spotted faster conditions. So far, so good, The move worked for Gabar and Gahine, who later accelerated north at close to 30 knots, overtaking Yves Le Blavec and Spaniard Alex Peya on Actual. As they reached the doldrums, there was little between Massif in second and Actual in third. Rothschild was a day ahead. It was a chance for the leaders to take a watch. Not only were Camas and Cordrelier the cleanest sailors in the fleet, they'd also a lead of almost 600 miles from the other boats. Now they had entered the Northern Hemisphere, their priority was keeping the boats safe and undamaged. But with 2,000 miles to go, the Rothschild skippers refused to slow. In fact, they were racing against the clock to reach the Azores as quickly as possible, where they'd spotted a front that could provide a sprint finish back to Brest. Behind them, the race for second place was as hot as ever. Massif and Actual were just 25 miles apart. Out in front, Rothschild did make the Azores in time and accelerated away to the finish. As the following boats were still heading to the Azores off the Portuguese coast, Camas and Cordrelier were crossing the finish line near Brest. The two skippers had traveled 17,084 miles in just under 29 days. 
The pair had averaged an extraordinary 24.5 knots. A hero's welcome awaited on the dock. Euh, bah non, une grande satisfaction, un bonheur énorme pour nous et pour toute l'équipe qui... Nous, on est arrivés il n'y a pas longtemps, mais il y a, ça fait 4 ans qu'ils travaillent sur ce bateau et il y a eu des moments difficiles, on se rappelle encore de la route du roi, mais je crois que ce bateau est magique et il l'a prouvé euh, cette course-là, une grande fierté pour euh, nous et pour toute l'équipe. Et on a une vraie confiance avec Charles et euh, Charles a été très bon et, et je sais qu'il m'a poussé euh, parfois et j'espère l'avoir poussé aussi d'autres fois pour, euh, pour pouvoir avancer au plus vite possible avec ce bateau. The cat and mouse chase for second and third continued past the Bay of Biscay. It was a nerve-wracking, jibing battle with Massif holding the smallest of leads. Any error would cost them dearly. Gabar and Gahine held their nerve and sailed Massif across the finish line in second place, two days and 21 hours behind the winners. Uh, a lot of frustration because uh, the boat was not uh, as fast as we could expect after the damage we, we had on uh, falls and uh, rudders. But that's life and uh, I think we we did a good job, even uh, if we, we had this damage, we managed to push the boat uh, and to be back in Brest first and to play for, for the second place at uh, the same time. In the end, it was almost a five-hour separation to third place. Le Blebec and Peya, the only non-French sailor in the race, took Actual home in third. Ravi, ravi, ravi d'arriver, on s'est fait une boucle atlantique incroyable. Avec une cadence, euh, c'était un peu les cadences infernales quand même. Hein. Ah on n'a on a, on a, on a pas arrêté quoi, on n'a pas arrêté, pas de temps mort. Et euh, une course euh, éprouvante, ça c'est sûr. For Camas and Cordrelier, it was another victory in their glittering careers. For their boat, Edmund de Rothschild, it was its first major long distance offshore win since being built three years ago. Denmark will be on the start line when the new Sail GP season kicks off in February. The boat will be helmed by 29-year-old Nikolai Sehested, who's competed in multi-Volvo ocean races and is a regular on the World Match Racing Tour. The team is being managed by a familiar face from the world of fin sailing, Olympic silver medalist Jonas Hög Christensen. The team will get a brand new F50 to race and Sehested will use a two-week training period to test the boat and pick his crew. The announcement from Denmark came soon after one of Herr Christensen's great Olympic rivals, Sir Ben Ainsley, announced he would also be competing in Sail GP. It's all changed for the British Sail GP team as Ainsley and the sponsor of his America's Cup team, Ineos, swooped in to represent the country. The most successful ever Olympic sailor has his eyes on the big $1 million prize and will likely bring in some of his America's Cup teammates. For us, this is a, a fantastic opportunity to partner with the GBR team in Sail GP and get out there in the, in, the, in the top circuit and get some fantastic racing under our belts. Olympian and former America's Cup helm, Chris Draper, remains team CEO, but last season's helm and flight controller, Dylan Fletcher and Stuart Bithell, will be focusing on their 49er campaign for Tokyo 2020. The 49er World Championships in Auckland, New Zealand, were raced in thrilling conditions. The Olympic champions, Peter Burling and Blair Tuke, were taken all the way by Eric Heil and Thomas Plursel. The Germans, who won bronze at the Rio Games, moved ahead after a slip by the Kiwis that saw Burling fall off the boat. Oh, Peter Burling's fallen. He's fallen off the side of the boat. Uh, is the pressure getting to the New Zealanders? But the America's Cup winners came back to finish the medal race fourth, just a place behind the Germans, meaning Burling and Tuke claimed their fifth world title in front of their home crowd. When the women lined up for their 49er FX medal race, the breeze and waves had grown even more. The title battle was between Olympic gold medalists Martin Grail and Kahena Kunza of Brazil, and the defending world champions Annemiek Beckering and Annette Duets of the Netherlands. Whoever beat the other would be world champions. There was an early warning of how careful they would have to be when the race leaders, Tina Lutz and Susan Burke of Germany, saw their medal hopes dashed. 
Soon after, Grail and Kunze, who were hunting down the Dutch just ahead of them, struggled to release their spinnaker and watch the world title disappear. That will be the world championship done and dusted. Beckering and Duets became the first sailors to win the FX world title twice. The slalom discipline is described by some as the Formula One of windsurfing. Riders compete in groups of eight on a course marked out with buoys. The deciding event of the season was off the South Sea Paradise Island of New Caledonia, which gave us four world-class days of racing with winds between 10 to 30 knots and a water state varying from choppy to extremely choppy, providing a complete test for the world's best racers. The men's competition turned into a close battle between Pierre Mortifon of France and Italian Matteo Iacchino, who started the event in terrific form, winning four individual races. The Italian's luck and results changed, however. He was even taken out by a sea snake in one race. By contrast, Mortifon became more and more consistent as the event unfolded, and the 30-year-old held his nerve to finally get his hands on the sport's biggest prize after so many years of challenging for the title. Iacchino finished second overall. Antoine Albo, the 25 times world champion from France, had to settle for third this time. I'm just, uh, I'm just trop content. I've worked hyper dur. I've worked super dur. I've passed à côté plein de fois. And ça y est, ça, ça y est, ça a payé. Ça y est, je l'ai. Ça y est, je le ramène à la maison. The women's competition was won by the indomitable Delphine Cousin Castel of France. The World Sailor of the Year nominee overcame tough competition to claim her second consecutive World Slalom title and her fourth overall. Coming up in part two, kites, foils and four new world champions. Still to come, going, going, over for Emirates Team New Zealand. And another record attempt, another blow for Spindrift. The Star Sailors League returned to Nassau in the Bahamas for its season grand finale. Some of the biggest stars of the sailing world came to compete for the $200,000 prize purse. Amongst the sailors competing were the top 10 ranked teams on the Star Sailors League leaderboard, as well as champions from other classes. All racing takes place in similar keelboats, putting the onus on the sailors' skills rather than the technology. The 23-foot Star class, which is almost 7 metres long, was an Olympic class for 80 years until it was dropped in 2012. Eight boats made the quarterfinals, only five would progress to the semis. Very light winds made for a tricky race. French duo Xavier Rohart and Pierre Alexis Ponsel were first into the top mark, but lost the advantage to Britain Lorenzo Chiavarini and his German crew Kilian Weiss. The pair then extended their lead to win the race ahead of Norwegian helm Eivind Melby. The six semi-finalists included Italian-German duo Diego Negri and Frithiof Klein, who went through automatically after finishing second in qualifying. Only the top three boats would go through to the final. As in the quarters, the French got ahead, but this time Roja and Ponso held that lead to win the race ahead of the Norwegians. But who would get the third qualifying spot? Double Olympic champion from Britain, Ian Percy and Swede Anders Ekstrom found the lightest of breeze just when they needed it to snatch a place in the final. The wind on Montague Bay finally filled in to provide the best conditions for the four boat final. Star world champions Mateusz Kuznerowicz of Poland and his Brazilian crew Bruno Prada 
made up the four-boat fleet as automatic qualifiers. Norwegian-US duo Avind Melby and Josh Revkin led around the top mark ahead of the French with Percy and Ekstrom third. Those top three battled bow to bow right to the final few centimetres. It looked as if the French had taken the victory, but Percy and Ekstrom on the far side somehow just sneaked across the line first. The Olympic legends were crowned Star Sailing League champions for 2019. The America's Cup World Series will return to the city of Portsmouth on the south coast of Britain. It will be a first chance for British fans to see their team's brand new foiling boat racing live. Ben Ainsley's Ineos Team UK will face the other three America's Cup teams from the USA, Italy and New Zealand. The World Series is a set of warm-up events for the America's Cup that begin in Cagliari, Sardinia in April before moving to Portsmouth in June and concludes in Auckland in December. Portsmouth has been renowned for the Royal Navy for over 500 years now. Um, it's important for the city council and for the city that it's not just perceived to be battleship grey. So international yacht racing gives us the opportunity to bring some razzmatazz, some colour, some excitement into the city and it introduces the city to new brands and new opportunities. Spindrift 2 had to turn back to port and give up on the Jules Verne trophy for the fastest circumnavigation of the globe. Less than 24 hours after setting off from La Trinité sur Mer on the French west coast, skipper Jan Guichard reported rudder problems that made the huge multi-hull impossible to control over 35 knots. It was hugely frustrating for Guichard and his 11 crew, who have been beset with rudder problems this year. It was Spindrift 2's fourth attempt at breaking the record, currently held by Francis Joyon. An Italian crew has again won the NACRA World Championships, but it was not last year's champions Ruggiero Tita and Caterina Banti. The former world champions won the medal race in Auckland, New Zealand, but their earlier results were not good enough for a podium finish. Instead, Teammates Vittorio Bissaro and Maiele Frascari came through a close battle with Lynn Seenholt and C.P. Lubeck of Denmark to claim the title. The Danes took silver and Australian cousins Jason Waterhouse and Lisa Darmanen won the bronze. Freestyle kiteboarding involves some of the most complex and highest jumps in the sport. The final round of the World Cup took place in Cambuco, Brazil, and it went right down to the wire before a new world champion was crowned. The overall leaderboard was close going into the event, which saw kiteboarders compete against each other in a knockout system. Adeori Corniel from the Dominican Republic led the world rankings going into the competition, but right behind him was the young Colombian Valentin Rodriguez. Both made the final, so whoever finished on top would take the world title. Corniel was on form, putting in another great performance. But three incredible nine-point scores and an 8.97 from Rodriguez saw him snatch the victory. It was a fluid and nerveless performance from the 17-year-old Colombian to claim the first World Championship title of his career. Cornel had to settle for silver, whilst Liam Whaley from Spain came third. The level now is just insane. Everyone's pushing the limits, and you just can't be happier with this first place. The women's world title had been decided before the final event. 15-year-old Michele Sol from Brazil had already won three out of the four World Cup events and had an unassailable lead. But would she win a fourth event in front of her home crowd? 
Seoul made the final, where her closest challenger was fellow Brazilian Bruna Cagia. Her return from injury last season saw her steadily improve in 2019, and here in Cambuco, she hit form. Incredibly though, she injured herself again when she collided with a surfer who'd entered the competition zone. But it was Sol who came out on top, and Kajia had to settle for second, which was also how the overall world rankings finished. The battle for third place was very close between Rita Arnaus from Spain and Pippa van Eersel from the Netherlands. The pressure showed with crashes from both, but in the end, it was Eersel who took the event bronze. I'm super happy to be, have this third world title, especially here in Brazil at home with all the people, all the Brazilians, it's super exciting. And hopefully next year I'll be able to get it again and do the surf tour as well, maybe. This year has been a challenging year for me. I was coming back from an injury. So I started the year slow and I was gaining my momentum, gaining my rhythm and just improved and to be finishing the year in second, I mean, it couldn't have like gone better actually, like this is a dream already. Emirates Team New Zealand have released footage of their AC-75 capsizing during a jibe in light winds off Auckland. The conditions made for a soft capsize and there were no reports of injuries. Yeah, you know, we had a really nice day out on the, the water matter and you know, we were pushing the boat um, you know, super hard around a, a few marks and you know, we ended up making a little mistake out of a jibe and you know, rolled it over and some, some pretty light breeze, but you know, it's what these boats are designed to do and you know, when you push the, the boundaries as hard as you can with the practice, uh, you know, it was going to happen at some stage. The crew eventually managed to rewrite the boat with the help of a support rib. The America's Cup defenders were the first to launch their boat in September last year and have been testing the 75-foot monohull hard ever since. The three challengers have also been in action testing their boats. INEOS Team UK have moved their training operations to Sardinia for the winter and join Italy's Luna Rossa, whose main base is on the Mediterranean island. All teams will be watching this footage with interest to see what they can glean about any potential weaknesses in the design of the Team New Zealand boat. Next month on the World Sailing Show. Up, up and away. Looking forward to the thrills and spills of a year of foiling. <laughs>